and we should be recording. Great. Hey guys, welcome to Fringe FM, the show where we get the world's most interesting and influential folks. Today we've got one of them, Isabel Arzmond on the program. Thanks for coming today. So it, go ahead. I was just going to say, uh, thanks so much for having me. No worries. It's always terribly hard to do the introduction, so which is why we just cut all of that into it. So you're a research analyst at GiveWell, and I think the best place to start the interview would be, what is effective altruism? And then we'll get into what you guys do. Yeah, sure. So um, my understanding of effective altruism is that, um, or is the idea of um, having the greatest impact you can have or trying to have the greatest impact you can have um, on the world and using um, evidence and reason uh, to go about doing that. And that's what we're driven by here at Fringe FM is to have a big impact by getting people that are focused on the big problems, which I know is pretty much what you are focused on. What's your day-to-day -day look like? Tell me a little bit more about GiveWell. Sure, so GiveWell's mission in particular is to identify outstanding giving opportunities for individual donors. So to help people have an impact, um, regardless of the size of their donation, really, by identifying giving opportunities that have strong evidence of effectiveness, that are cost-effective, that are transparent and that have room for additional funding. Those are the four criteria that we use to, uh, to evaluate programs. Um, and so we research different programs and create a short list of what we think are the most outstanding opportunities. Um, all of our research is freely and publicly available on our website. So there are a, l a lot of big problems in the world and you talked a little bit about how you categorize those, but in terms of people who want to either get involved or donate, what is the way to look at these type of problems? How do you guys evaluate on a more specific basis? What are the big problems today? Sure. So when GiveWell started, we were really open to giving opportunities in any cause. I think being cause agnostic is something that um, is unique about GiveWell's approach to giving and uh, cause agnosticism, probably also one of the uh, most unique qualities that effective altruism has. Um, so when GiveWell started, um, it was founded by Ellie Hassenfeld and Holden Karnofsky, who were working in the finance industry and um, wanted to give away um, some of what they were earning um, but when they started researching online to try to find uh, the best places to give money away, uh, to donate, they found that there was really a lack of research addressing that question. Um, so they started GiveWell in 2007 um, and evaluated uh, giving opportunities in a wide range of causes from uh, global poverty to um, education in the United States to uh, economic opportunity in the United States. But since then, GiveWell's focus has become more specifically on identifying giving opportunities in global health and poverty alleviation. And that's because when we started from this um, broad swath of causes, we found that the ones that were the most evidence-backed and the most cost-effective tended to be in global health and development. Basically, it's a lot easier to bring someone from extremely low levels of, of life quality to a bit higher than it is to bring someone who's maybe in the U.S. unemployed, but they have a cell phone and is getting around. Is that kind of the idea behind it? I think that's right. The idea is that the more low-hanging fruit has largely already been uh, picked in wealthier areas. Um, and so like in the U.S., we don't have malaria. We don't have um, endemic worm infections in young children. We don't have um, large numbers of people living on less than a dollar a day in that kind of poverty. Um, and so global health and development is where you look if you uh, want to be reaching those problems that are more cost effective um, to address. How do you guys think about action versus research versus education? Because there's the quick fixes, there's the longer term fixes, and then there's something in between. Hmm. Could you say a little more about what you mean? Yeah, so like for instance with 
curing malaria. There's a lot of ways you could go about it with nets, having better medicines, or you could look at it from a CRISPR perspective of let's create a gene drive so that malaria carrying mosquitoes no longer can carry malaria. Or there's other ways of even further out type research opportunities. What are the technologies that are most driving the future and how do we get those in the hands of the people that don't have them? It's kind of the time horizons. How do you weigh time horizons when it comes to benefits? Sure, that's a great question. And a key part of our research and the product that we're trying to create is um, to make our work vettable by anyone who comes to our website. So publishing the full details of our analysis and um, enabling people to decide whether they agree with us and being able to make a really full case for why something is a great opportunity. Um, and so I think that's a key part of why the opportunities that we recommend tend to be um, the more uh, short term or direct ways of addressing a problem. So in the case of malaria, preventing people from getting malaria by distributing nets and by distributing uh, seasonal malaria chemo prevention as opposed to by um, uh, funding like technology uh, to change the genetics of mosquitoes, I guess, for example, um, because it's, there's an evidence base for insecticide treated nets as a way to um, prevent malaria. And unfortunately, when it comes to uh, more speculative uh, research or programs, there just doesn't tend to be the same evidence base. Um, so it's not something that we're closed off to evaluating, but it's something that um, might be a less good fit, at least as long as there's uh, not really evidence suggesting that it's already been demonstrated to work. How do you think about the ethics of the solutions you guys propose? So like with, uh, with the malaria and the gene drive that I was talking about, essentially mm -hmm. they've already shown that if you put a mosquito in with a group of other mosquitoes and one of them has this gene drive, what it basically does is it overwrites the evolutionary process. So every mosquito evolves with this specific mutation. So they've, they've done studies where you put a mosquito in and all of its children have to be boys. Well, you come back three days later and every mosquito is dead. So they have the provenness of this is effective, but not necessarily what happens from an ethical perspective. Do you guys think about that at all in your work? Yeah, so it sounds like you might be talking a little bit about sort of like the uh, first order impact of something versus like the second order and what happens down the line once you like release that solution into the wild. Um, and yeah, so that's definitely something that we would want to think about um, that I think ties in somewhat to a cause that we've more recently started looking at, uh, which is that um, in the past year, we've become interested in evaluating opportunities in policy advocacy and more specifically in um, the policies that we're focusing on at least to start are or tend to be uh, policies that would improve health in low and middle income countries. So um, we're interested in looking at tobacco taxation, road safety. Um, we made a grant um, to an organization that aims to uh, prevent suicides by um, banning lethal pesticides. Um, so that's sort of a new part of our work. Um, and I thought of that because I think that's an area where you have, uh, there are sort of two components to it, I guess. There's like, can you pass a policy? And then there's like, what happens? Um, yeah, it's just a bit more complicated, I guess, causally, because you, we know that um, smoking is bad for you, uh, but what happens if you, uh, tax tobacco, does that have any unintended consequences? And that's certainly a question we would want to look at and I haven't been deeply involved in that um, research. I'm not sure if that gets at your question at all, but it made no, me that, think about it a little bit because there are sort of two steps to it in that way. It gets at it. So one of, the, one of the challenges I see with charities and most nonprofits is the fact that 
they're judged generally speaking on efficacy and financial financial data. So I remember listening to a TED talk and the guy was hired as the XYZ of whatever for the the Breast Cancer Association. They gave mm-hmm. him a bud they gave him a budget of ninety thousand dollars or nine hundred thousand dollars or something of that effect and said, figure out the most effective way to reduce breast cancer. So what he did is he blew all of the money on advertising and a hundred X the donations. So now instead of having ninety thousand or nine hundred thousand, they had a hundred times as much money, and he was fired because the money didn't go towards solving the problem. Mm-hmm. How do you, how do you think about the overhead costs of a charity, and what is the best way for charities, nonprofits, to make an impact and still fit within that constraint that we have between the profit and nonprofit sectors? Sure. So that's something that. Um We've written about a fair amount, actually, the emphasis that's placed on the overhead ratio. And I think, um, thankfully, that's gotten a bit more attention in recent years for the ways in which it's an inadequate way to assess um, how good a charity really is at making a positive impact in the world. I think you can certainly imagine a case where an organization is spending all of their budget on um, exorbitant salaries and like, I don't know, uh, luxury travel. And that's obviously not something you want, but, um, at least for a time, it seemed like there was a lot of emphasis being placed on, you know, whether an organization is spending, uh, 95 or 98% of their budget on programs. And another problem that you get into is just that organizations can kind of play with, um, I don't mean that in a nefarious way, I guess, but there's leeway in how you categorize costs. Um, What's an administrative cost? What's a program cost? Uh, You'll sometimes hear an organization claim to spend 100%, to have zero overhead, uh, which doesn't really make any sense. Um, So we certainly look at financial data from all of the organizations that we recommend and that we evaluate Um, And we publish as much of that as we can online. Um, But uh, we don't really explicitly calculate something like an overhead ratio and use that in our decision making. Uh, We look more at what's an organization's overall budget for a program and um, how many nets are being distributed or deworming treatments are being distributed um, by them. And um, yeah, going from there. And I think another thing that we found is that the biggest driver of differences in cost effectiveness across charities um, that we've seen is just what program they're carrying out. So whether they're doing um, something really cost effective, like distributing insecticide treated nets or whether they're doing something that's uh, less evidence backed and cost effective. And that's sort of where you see um, the biggest uh, differences. Doesn't that get dangerous though? Because what's cost effective is obvious and generally speaking, less exponential. What do you mean by that? So for instance, putting money into, into malaria nets, for instance, might be incredibly effective, but what about putting money into, let's say, education in third world countries? So how do you weigh out the, the, the second and third order effects? I know we talked about it a little bit before, but of the things that have a bigger potential to change the world versus changing lives on a, a smaller scale, which has a, a, gra- a grassroots type effect. Mm. I'm not sure I'm quite following the uh, concern, I guess. Sorry. <laughs> um, I guess it comes back to some of, some of the same things as before mm-hmm. in that some of the, the most important things aren't cost effective. So what's the price you put on an education? What's the mm-hmm. price you put on creativity? What's mm-hmm. the price on things that generically speaking can't have a price put on that? I mean, I guess you, you do the same thing with a lot of what you guys are doing. Better yet, how do you put a price on a life? Yeah, so I think 
part of what you're getting at sounds to me like something I've heard before, which is sort of if everyone shifts all of their giving to things like uh, nets and deworming, what happens to arts and culture and other um, organizations that wouldn't fit GiveWell's model, but that um, bring like joy or culture or whatever to people's lives. And I think that my reaction to that at least is just kind of that we're so far from that world. Like what GiveWell is moving to, in terms of our money moved um, to our recommended charities is just still a pretty small piece of the overall pie of charitable giving. Um, so I guess that's something I'd be more worried about if we seemed to be approaching that um, point in time. But I do think you make a good point, which is that some things inherently lend themselves more easily to a cost effectiveness analysis than others do. Um, so we've looked into education in uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, we actually recently published an updated report on that. Um, and we found that there's not a lot of robust evidence linking um, educational programs like vouchers or scholarships um, to later in life impacts like on um, income or employment. Um, but you could certainly imagine that if you place a high enough value on a year of schooling for its own sake, then that doesn't really matter. Uh, well, it's also the time. Like if someone dies, you have your stat tomorrow. If someone doesn't die, you have 80 years of waiting or whatever the number is. Yeah, so that's true, but I think is not an impediment in all cases to us being able to evaluate something. So deworming, um, which is one of the programs that we recommend, we recommend it primarily based on um, one study really that found later in life income effects as a result of being dewormed as a child. Um, so they're at the 20 year follow up stage now. Um, and with education, there are some studies that are at, you know, at least the 10 year out mark with looking at um, impacts. And then you do, of course, have to extrapolate, you know, if there was an impact on income 10 years out, how long do you think it'll last? And that's something that we do in our deworming cost effectiveness is sort of um, take our best guesses. Where are the, the biggest areas of charity and donation worldwide in terms of focuses, sectors, industries, et cetera? Mm, in terms of all charitable giving? Yeah, not just in terms of the top recommendations. We'll talk about those in a sec, but in terms of what's actually happening. Mm. Yeah, so I don't have statistics on like the global giving sector off the top of my head. I do know that um, I think one of the largest slices or maybe the largest slice in the United States is to religious organizations. Um, and I know that only a very small portion of giving, um, I believe it's less than 10% and maybe substantially more, uh, substantially less than that goes to uh, international causes from U.S. donors. So basically those, those two stats make you cringe as someone who's focused on outcomes. Um, certainly not the most uh, You don't have to be that diplomatic. <laughs> I, I know, we, we're both thinking it. Everyone else out there is thinking it. We're building bigger churches just like forever. Um, so what are the areas where you guys have focused on that you found the biggest impact? We've talked a little bit about malaria. We've talked about deworming. What are the mm -hmm. reasons behind that? Yeah, sure. So we currently recommend nine organizations that are on our top charities list. And seven of them work on health interventions. Four of them run deworming programs um, for school-aged children, school-based deworming programs. Two of them do malaria prevention, so that's one that distributes insecticide-treated nets, and the other does a program called seasonal malaria chemo prevention, which is essentially um, a treatment given to young children um, in areas where malaria is seasonal to prevent them from contracting malaria during that heavy season of uh, malaria transmission. And then the final organization we recommend that um, does a health intervention is a vitamin A supplementation program also for young children. 
And the idea there is that uh, vitamin A supplementation in areas where vitamin A deficiency is common can reduce, or there's evidence that it reduces um, child mortality, particularly due to infectious diseases like measles and diarrhea. So the idea is that there's some sort of um, protective effect. So mm -hmm. go, go ahead. ahead. I was just going to go on to our um, other two top charities. So if you want to pause here and ask anything, go for it. No, go for it. Cool. And then the final two organizations that we recommend work on more uh, direct short-term poverty alleviation type programs. So one, Give Directly distributes unconditional cash transfers to very poor households in East Africa. And the other, um, which is called No Lean Season and is run by Evidence Action, uh, gives subsidies to um, people living in rural Bangladesh um, who work in areas that are agricultural. And there's um, a lean season, essentially, which is the time of year when there's not agricultural work and families tend to experience a dip in consumption. But if they're provided with a subsidy that essentially covers the price of a round trip bus ticket, they can um, seasonally migrate to areas where there are job opportunities and um, earn a wage and uh, send that money home to their families and avoid the dip in consumption that might otherwise occur. I wanna jump into Give Directly, not specifically mm -hmm. their model, but the, the implication. So we're moving towards a world where a lot of work is automated. We're moving towards a world where there's increasing income inequality. How do you at GiveWell think about those type of opportunities, so a universal basic income type system, and how would you evaluate something like that if larger, more, we'll just say a first world country wanted to try to, to implement something similar? Sure, yeah, so I think universal basic income is obviously a really uh, hot topic right now, at least in the economics world. Um, and I think it's really exciting that Give Directly is doing this research. So they're running a universal basic income study actually, um, in East Africa. And I think it's really exciting to have that research happening because my impression is that most of the research that's been done on uh, universal basic incomes, a lot of which has been done at um, a small scale and isn't necessarily uh, actually, I guess, a universal basic income in some cases. It's, I'm getting into the weeds on the research here, so I'll pause. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's really exciting that GiveDirectly is doing that research and to see what the outcomes of that are. So they're funding this study that's going to provide, um, it's operating in Kenya, and I believe some people will receive um, this universal basic income for um, two years, and other another arm of the study will receive it for 12 years, and then there's a control arm as well. and. Um, so I think it'll be really exciting. Obviously, we're a long ways out from seeing the results of that, but to see what that looks like. Um, and I guess I'm not sure how informative that will be uh, for you know countries like the US or Canada that might think of implementing similar programs, but I know that there's um, a lot of research happening all over the world right now on this idea of a universal basic income. And I think that something like what GiveDirectly is doing is an important um, piece in giving a fuller understanding of what the results of something like that would look like. Which is very important. Do you think it'll be, every locale will be a bit different in terms of how people react? Because if so, do we need to run a bajillion tests and can we afford to wait and run a bajillion tests? Mm. Yeah, that's a really, key question that we get into, not just with universal basic income, but with any program. And I think even more so, um, the more, I guess some programs you imagine that the specific local context will have a bigger impact than in others. So with something like distributing insecticide treated nets, you might imagine that it functions approximately the same way regardless of where you do it and it's really just a matter of like how common is malaria but something like an educational program might have really different impacts in one context than in another and so this question of sort of like we don't want to overgeneralize, but we also can't afford to run a study in every place 
is just a really key one. And it's definitely something that we encounter in our research. So we often end up applying um, an external validity adjustment to studies. So we've done that for vitamin A supplementation, for example. Um, a lot of the key studies that were done on uh, child mortality and vitamin A supplementation were done in the 1980s. And you can imagine that things have changed a fair amount since then. They are also weren't necessarily done in the same countries. Um, and so we basically apply a discount to the results of those studies to try to account for uh, things that have changed since then, um, including, but not necessarily limited to, like changes in the rates of vitamin A deficiency. Um, but going back to your question about universal basic income, you know, my best guess is that um, there will be some things that vary from high income countries to low income countries, but are somewhat consistent within income brackets. There will be other things that are really uh, dependent on context. Um, yeah, you can imagine different cultures or communities reacting differently to the idea of a universal basic income. Um, so I think that'll definitely be a challenge. Like one challenge I definitely see, the big difference between, that you see between people that are wealthy and people that are poorer is generally how they think about money. Generally mm -hmm. speaking, a lot of that comes from A, having the money and B, having a different upbringing. But if you're mm -hmm. rich, you think about money in terms of not how can I use this, but how can I make this grow? And typically when you're poor, you have to think more hand to fist, how am I going to survive? So you spend money in very, very different habits. So I, I feel like there could be some challenges there between the short term and long term focus if you were to give people money and they blow the money versus giving the money and building something with that. That reminds me a bit of a distinction between uh, Give Directly's cash transfer program and a lot of other cash transfer programs that have been done, which is that Give Directly is like unconditional cash transfer program, the one that we um, have directed money to, is essentially giving households about $1,000, which represents about one year's worth of income or consumption for a typical household that benefits. And so it's really an amount of money that you can imagine would be transformative and you see people using a substantial amount of it, of course, on things like uh, food, um, but also investing in things like a really common use of give direct as cash transfers that we've seen is um, buying an iron roof. So a lot of households have these thatch roofs that need to be repaired about once a year and that's expensive. And so you're better off in the long term if you have an iron roof, but um, I don't remember how much it costs, but it's at least a few thousand or a few hundred dollars to get an iron roof. And so if you never have that cash on hand, um, you're never going to make that investment. And so I think that's an example of a way in which Give Directly's program of giving these um, amounts of money that are enough for a household to make an investment or um, start a business or do something like that might be um, different in nature from giving um, something that's more like a small bonus on top of what you're already earning that maybe is more likely to go toward uh, food or just getting by. Or a new cell phone or something where we have some trouble with uh, the system. I, I don't know. I don't want to sound cynical on that, but I feel like there are some inherent challenges. Where do you see us, where do you see us headed in terms of what you're seeing both in the field, technologically, right now you're in San Francisco, right by the Bay, you're right around the center of innovation. What's it like working, it, GiveWell is a, a nonprofit, I believe. What's it like working mm -hmm. in that sector around the, one of the most capitalistic and successful areas in the world? Yeah, it's certainly interesting being in the nonprofit sector and spending um, a lot of my time uh, reading, reports from programs that are happening in the poorest parts of the world to deal with things like malaria. Um, but then uh, also being, like you said, in the heart of Silicon Valley. Um, and of course we and our top charities benefit in some ways from being in Silicon Valley, uh, being around people who have the capacity to give to our top charities. Um, one of our uh, 
largest, one of the largest donors to our recommended charities is a foundation called Good Ventures that was founded by one of the co-founders of Facebook and his wife, uh, Dustin Moskovitz and Carrie Tuna. So in that sense, we're certainly a beneficiary of um, Facebook and Silicon Valley. Um, yeah, so I'd say it's an interesting juxtaposition. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I remember thinking about this a long time ago and people saying, go to, go to Africa to build houses. And I would think that's not very effective. I'm one person in one body. What if I build a business building houses? Or what if I build a business helping people build business build houses? Or what if I just make, in my terms, a shit ton of money so then I can focus on things that matter and invest in the, the places that most need it? How do you think about how do you think about that exponential impact, not just of your work, but of what you guys are focused on, and how to think bigger and not get caught up in the weeds? Hmm. Yeah, I think the question of sort of direct impact versus trying to have some sort of institutional impact versus doing something like earning to give is certainly something that I've thought about and that I think a lot of my colleagues and also a lot of our donors think about. Um, uh, I guess it's probably something that anyone who's interested in like really having an impact on the world um, has thought about, especially because you're necessarily waiting, how can I have the biggest impact against like what's actually a fulfilling and feasible career for me? Um, and it, yeah, it's just really hard to know, I guess. Um, I'm not sure that answered your question at all, so feel free to follow up. No, it's okay. A lot of questions just lead to strange tangents where we don't remember where we got there. I know with us personally, French FM, we're fiscally sponsored, so we can accept donations as a nonprofit. And the reason why is we're essentially creating or trying to create valuable, engaging, and challenging conversations and content to educate and push people around the world, but there's not really a business model behind that. Mm -hmm. But becoming a nonprofit is also very hard. So what would you recommend to people that are thinking about it in terms of, do I go the nonprofit route? Do I want to seek grants, donors, et cetera? What's that process look like? Hmm. In terms of starting a nonprofit or getting involved in the nonprofit sector? Either getting involved or the funding to focus on an important mission. Hmm. Yeah. So GiveWell has been pretty lucky in that we haven't historically put a ton of emphasis on outreach and have managed to more organically, I guess, um, attract a base of donors, which is not to say we've put no effort into outreach, but it's only in the last couple of years that we've started thinking more about what we could do to grow our influence in terms of um, advertising. We experimented with podcast advertising, um, starting about a year, a year and a half ago or something like that. Um, we've been thinking more about um, media, getting mentions in the media, that sort of thing. Um, and um, we've always put um, some emphasis on maintaining relationships with our donors, but thinking more about what the um, best or most strategic way to do that is, I guess. Um, so that's something that we're sort of new to and working on figuring out, but it's something that we've written a little bit about what we've learned so far on our blog. Um, I think that was one part of your question. What was the second part? The second part was if people are considering the profit nonprofit route. Hmm. Yeah, I guess I can't speak much to the like technical differences. Um, but in terms of like, for people who are interested in starting or getting involved with nonprofits, um, there are certainly nonprofits we'd like to see. There are a handful of uh, programs in global health and development that we've looked into and that we think are promising, but where we, at the intervention level, but where we Sometimes. haven't identified. So um, let's see. Cataract surgery, uh, surgery to repair obstetric fistula. Um, a what? Obstetric fistula. So that's a condition that occurs um, during prolonged obstructed labor um, where a hole essentially develops between a woman's vagina and bladder or rectum. And it can be really, um, uh, it's like a 
medical condition, obviously, but can also be really stigmatizing socially. Um, and there's, it doesn't really occur um, in the United States, at least if it does, it's repaired, but it occurs less where you have, um, you know, high quality uh, obstetric care. And so it's mainly an issue in um, low and middle income parts of the world, and especially where people are having babies at a younger age. Um, so um, that's a program that we're interested in. Um, iron and folic acid um, supplementation and fortification. We've actually recently made um, two incubation grants, which I'll talk about our incubation grants in a minute because I think that's an interesting uh, bit of work that we're working on. But we've made two grants to um, early stage iron and folic acid fortification programs, um, or I think one's a fortification, the other's a supplementation program. Um, so like that's an intervention that we think could be really cost effective and that we're excited to um, get more uh, promising charities off the ground. I think we'd also love to see like more organizations like the Against Malaria Foundation, which we recommend. So there's like a pretty substantial um, global gap worldwide for insecticide treated nets. Um, yeah, so I guess I'd just say there's, I think there's a lot of room out there for good work to be done. What would you recommend to an organization like Fringe FM, one where the benefits are very much not in the near term, but mm -hmm. at the same time have the potential to inspire and change the lives and thus trajectories of important and seemingly random people around the world? Hmm. I'm not sure I really uh, have any advice. It's a little bit outside our wheelhouse, I think. No worries. I figured, but it was worth it. You said uh, something okay. about incubation grants? Yeah. So uh, about five years ago, we started this program called Give Well Incubation Grants. At that point in time, this was around 2013, we'd been recommending uh, the same four top charities for a little while, and we were really having trouble identifying um, new top charities to add to our list. And um, we recommend organizations to donors at the point in time at which they already have a track record of carrying out a program successfully. But we started thinking, what if we got involved at an earlier stage and helped promising organizations like build up that track record to the point that we were able to recommend them? Um, and so that's how our incubation grants program started. One of our first grantees actually, and I should say that these are grants that we've made um, through recommendations to Good Ventures, the foundation that I mentioned that we work closely with. So they're not things that we recommend yet to uh, individual donors who come to our website, um, but they're things that we hope that one day we might. Um, so one of the first grants that we made was to no Lean Season, which is the seasonal migration organization that I mentioned earlier. Um, it was after they had a randomized control trial indicating that this might be um, a promising, effective, cost-effective program, uh, but before they had tried scaling up. Um, so we provided some funding to them, and in 2017, they had uh, scaled up and built a track record to where we were able to evaluate them and ultimately recommend them as a give well top charity. Uh, so that's our first incubation grants success story, I guess, um, of a charity uh, coming through that pipeline. Um, but since then, we've made uh, several other grants to promising early stage organizations. And we've also made two other kinds of grants. Um, one is grants to help existing organizations improve their monitoring. Um, and so that's something that we've worked on with an organization called ID Insight. They're an impact evaluation um, NGO. Um, and uh, we funded them to do a number of projects, but one of those projects was to work with the Against Malaria Foundation, one of our top charities. Um, to identify and uh, make recommendations for ways to improve weaknesses in the Against Malaria Foundation's monitoring processes. Um, and then uh, the final type of incubation grant that we've made is to fund research on uh, programs. 
that might inform future recommendations. Um, so one example of that um, is another project that we funded ID Insight to do on what we call beneficiary preferences. So a key part of our recommendations is, comes down to being able to compare different outputs against one another or different outcomes against one another. So how do you compare increasing a family's income to averting the death of a young child? There's no uh, objective right answer for how to do that. Uh, but something that we think could be informative uh, when it comes to making trade-offs like that is having knowledge of how the people who benefit from Givewell recommended programs would make those trade-offs themselves. And so ID Insight has done a pilot survey of um, households in Kenya, I believe in rural Kenya, um, asking them questions. I believe they started with questions about um, averting a death at different ages, um, as well as questions that more directly traded off um, amounts of money versus impacts on mortality. Um, yeah, but then you also have to assume people can be logical and economical in some ways inhuman enough to be able to say, well, if my kid was five, I'm not sure, but because he's eight, doesn't, doesn't that create some challenges having that be, that be something that people decide? Certainly. And I think that's one reason why we're certainly wary of taking any number that an analysis like that might split, spit out at face value, because I think you, you can try different framing. So you can try, um, you know, your child versus a child in this village. Um, but you also run into challenges when you deal with really large numbers, I think. Um, because I think most people's intuition is that it would take um, at least doubling quite a few households incomes for one year to be a sort of equivalently good outcome to averting a death at any age. Uh, but is the right number one, 10, a hundred, a thousand, 10,000. It's just really hard for people to conceptualize numbers like that. Um, and so I think there, there are just certainly challenges, but we're, we essentially have to do that kind of analysis. Cause people and, are too weak to do it themselves. Well, because if we're going to assess whether things are in the same ballpark of cost effectiveness, that's kind of a necessary part of it. How can you know, or how can you make any sort of judgment about how cost effective give directly is compared to a bed net or an insecticide treated net distribution program without making some sort of subjective judgment call about mortality versus wealth. Um, and so it's just sort of a core part of doing our jobs, I think. Does it ever keep you up at night? <laughs> um, I don't know that it keeps me up at night, but it's certainly been the topic of like when I've, uh, you know, just hung out with coworkers, we'll like go get a drink after work and we'll have like a two or three hour long conversation about these moral trade-offs. Um, so it's something that we think about a lot, both um, at work and outside of it. So I'm reading a book now from Ian Banks, The Culture Series. And in it, there is a struggle with a higher class civilization and, uh, and a less developed one. And the, the higher developed one has the rules that are akin to Star Trek's um, don't interfere rule, whatever it's called. And the, the lower one's like, well, my brother was murdered. This is, this is not right. How can you do something like this? And they're like, oh, but it's okay because we have these rules that are here to be for your benefit of not interfering. And it's the... Uh, it's the intellectual superiority of knowing what's best. How do you avoid a situation like that where, and, and I'm playing devil's advocate a little bit here, but how do you deal with situations like that where the people themselves may choose differently, but you have to be able to be the one that makes the decision that whether or not it feels right, it is right. Sure, I think that's a really good question. And um, a question, that I heard asked at, um, I was at a discussion about this beneficiary preferences research. 
Um, and someone asked a question, which was essentially like, why should we care what people say they want? Why shouldn't we just make a decision? Um, I personally think that that's a pretty dangerous attitude, I guess. And it's important uh, to me to try to gauge how people would make those trade-offs themselves. Um, but at the same time, yeah, that would be a really tricky situation. We're not in that situation yet, but um, if we were to get some results of this beneficiary preferences research that was just wildly out of line with our own intuitions, um, I don't know what we would do with our bottom line recommendation. I think one thing we would do would just be uh, write about all of that and um, enable donors to an extent to make a choice for themselves. Um, but people know McDonald's is bad for them and they still eat it anyways. <laughs> um, <laughs> but yeah, I mean, that would be a really, a really difficult situation. One thing that we, um, and I mean, I guess this partly comes down to donors choosing versus beneficiaries choosing, but one thing we've tried to do to at least enable people who have a different worldview from the median give well staff member, um, to make their own informed choices is we publish our cost effectiveness analyses online and we've tried to make it reasonably easy for a person to make a copy of it and fill in one of the columns with their own inputs and their own moral values and see how that changes the relative cost effectiveness numbers that are um, that come out of our analysis um, so people are super welcome to uh, do that and deviate from whatever our bottom line recommendation is because they value health a lot more than wealth or vice versa um, compared to the median give well staff member. It would be interesting if you guys tried to pull either existing research or create your own Wikipedia-esque system for this where you got information from people who submitted randomly around the world so you could get a better feel for how that differed between cultures, et cetera. I imagine it would be very interesting and very valuable data. Yeah, I know there's been a little bit of like um, me mechanical Turk research done on this question. Um, I don't believe anything sort of revelatory came out of that, um, but that was something that we uh, looked at around the time that we were thinking about doing some of this beneficiary preferences research. And I think it'd be great to see more of that and more robust research on that. A fair amount of the research that has been done on, so there's something called like the value of a statistical life, um, which is like what value different um, like governmental organizations would place on averting a death. Um, but most of the research that's been done on that has been done in high income countries where you can imagine that the results would just be different. Astronomically so, because once you get over that 70,000 some odd mark a year, there's not that much of a change in quality of life despite income increasing. It's uh, diminishing returns. Right. So that's another thing that we think about when we're um, doing our uh, cost effectiveness analysis, because a key input is like, how would you value uh, doubling someone's income for one year? And we use um, like a logarithmic model um, of sort of the benefits of increasing consumption. Um, so, uh, under that model, regardless of what your starting income is, it's, um, equally good to have your income doubled, basically. Um, it's not a perfect model, um, but that's sort of what we use and it's the best thing we've come up with. Um, but I think it's also just really hard for us to conceptualize what it's like to have your income doubled if your income is $300 per person a year versus if you um, have a reasonably well-paying job in San Francisco. Um, it's just totally different. Interesting. It'd be interesting if you had like a logarithmic scale divided by an exponential. I feel like that might be closer to, closer to the truth. So I want to I wanna transition a little bit. One of the things we like to do is we get people at the foremost of their field, and then we talk about the things outside of their field. So outside of what you're focused on day to day, what technologies or fields are you most interested in and why? Hmm. 
it's an interesting question. I was not um, expecting it. Uh, I have to say, I'm not a huge technology person, I guess. <laughs> um, what's your passion? Yeah. What's your hobby? What's my hobby? Outside of what you're doing now, which obviously is very consuming. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I read a lot of books, but not a lot of nonfiction. I'm more of a fiction person. And I like uh, traveling to new places. Um, I get to do that a little bit for my job, but I wish I got to do it more for my job. So I just do it a fair amount on my own. Travel, uh, yeah, makes you into a more yeah. well-rounded person. Yeah, but I was um, an engineering major at Stanford for four years. So I feel like I was kind of like in the crucible of startups in Silicon Valley um, for a little while, um, uh, but without ever having like the desire to start a startup myself or anything like that. Why do you think that is? I don't know exactly. I mean, <laughs> I'm, I'm just not a huge technology person. Like I haven't updated the like iOS on my laptop in probably a a year or two um yeah i don't know <laughs> it's okay when when you're busy and focused on saving changing improving the world then there's not a lot of time for shaving or any of the other things you just got to get to <laughs> it right i just kind of wait for new technologies to get like tested and get the um wrinkles ironed out and then i like to um adopt them, I guess, but I'm not an, I'm not really an early adopter. What would you say is the biggest myth about your work, about charity nonprofit work? Hmm. Good question. I definitely find give well and the work that I do specifically pretty hard to explain to people. Um, this isn't about the charitable sector as a whole, but like working for a nonprofit that doesn't provide a direct service in the traditional sense, I guess, I think is just sort of confusing to people. Um, and I think, here's one, I think there's like a common, um, a common inclination, I guess, to think of charity as entirely driven by like the heart or by passion or something like that. And um, not to see space for being analytical within that. Um, so I think it can be challenging to want a world where people are more, um, thoughtful about their giving in the sense of wanting to give to things that are evidence-backed and cost-effective without seeming um, critical of the giving that people are already doing. Um, it's just a really different mindset, I think, to charity that GiveWell kind of has. Um, I think there's a way to think about charity that's sort of just anything you give is good and great and like above and beyond what you have to do. So just um, follow your heart or whatever. And I think that it really just depends on what you're trying to get out of your giving and if what you want is a warm, fuzzy feeling um, or to just feel connected to a particular organization, then that um, makes sense as a way to give. But if what you want is to believe that your donation is um, having an impact, I think it requires a more analytical approach um, that's somewhat at odds with how people uh, traditionally think about giving. Well, that's the problem with empathy is you think it makes you a better person, but it just makes you more of a selective us against them person. It's the Sarah McLaughlin thing. The TV comes on and they try to make you sad so you donate money versus this is why this matters. I, I would argue definitely that what you guys are doing in effective altruism is more important. Not that focusing on other missions is not important, it's just less so. I think, 
There's definitely um, a temptation I see sometimes too to treat giving more analytically as lacking in empathy. Um, and I think that that's just really not the case. Like I think for a lot of us at Give Well, wanting to give effectively comes from a really deep place of um, caring about the world and about other people. Um, it's but again, I also it's compassion though, not empathy. So the difference is empathy gets hijacked and you can't help but feel what the other person is feeling with empathy, with compassion. Instead, you're just able to understand. That's the, that's the big, there's some really interesting interviews with Sam Harris and um, some, other, some other researcher on the, the problems with empathy. But empathy is what creates wars. You see one girl get killed and then suddenly, oh my God, the entire nation has to go save her versus thinking about things a little bit compassionately and dispassionately at the same time. Hmm. I hadn't ever heard that way of uh, distinguishing between empathy and compassion. Yeah, there's one where you well, there's one where you feel for the person, and there's one where you feel what they feel. And if you hmm. feel what they feel, it often leads to bad choices, hmm. which is the difference between effective altruism and traditional charity. That's um, yeah. We, I've had you on here for a while. Are there any other topics that you think we should cover? Um. I don't think so. Yeah, Isabel, nothing comes to mind. Isabel, if there's one thing that you had to leave people with, a quote, a call to action, uh, get up in arms, what would it be and why? I think it's amazing the amount of impact that you can have um, when you do uh, focus on uh, I've, evidence and cost effectiveness with your giving. Um, so our best guess currently is that um, you can avert a death from malaria with roughly $3,000. The figure is something like that. And that's obviously not um, a small amount of money, um, but it's also kind of amazing um, that you can have that big of an impact, I think, with that sum of money. Um, and yeah, so I'd leave people with that. Think about what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the 80-20. The 80-20 is always valuable. 20% of the impact, um, uh, inputs get 80% of the results. Where's the best place for people to find you, Isabel? Uh, Givewell.org. Givewell.org. Guys, we'll show links and everything in the show notes. Make sure you reach out to them, look into it a little bit more. If you're interested, they've got all of their top charities listed. By the way, Fringe FM would be a great one as well. If you guys support what we're doing, you can find out more on the website. Thanks, Isabel. Thank you. Awesome. That was fun.